In the previous video, we derived the vorticity stream function formulation of the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. We saw that there were some advantages over the primitive variables formulation considered in an earlier video. However, there was one major problem, and that was that we don't have boundary conditions for the stream function vorticity. So we want to address that in this video. So we'll start by discussing stream function first and see what boundary conditions we might have on stream function, then talk about how they can be adapted for vorticity. Then I'll look at two methods, Thom's method and Jensen's method for getting Dirichlet boundary conditions for vorticity. Let's look at a specific flow. This is the driven cavity flow. So we have the x and y coordinates, it's 2D. And we have a rectangular domain where the left, the bottom, and the right sides are not moving. So we have u, v is zero on each of those three sides. But then the top is moving to the right with a velocity of one. So it's a driven cavity. The flow in the cavity is being driven by the movement of this upper surface. This is a very typical problem for testing CFD codes on. It's a simple geometry, doesn't have any inlets or outlets. We don't have to worry about those types of boundary conditions. So it's a relatively simple and straightforward problem to develop and test our methods. People have been doing this for years, and so there's lots of good results in the literature for this particular driven cavity problem. But let's look at this from the boundary condition point of view. So you notice I've labeled the points A, B, C, and D in the corners so we can identify the, the various boundaries. Now remember that the stream function is defined as follows. U is partial psi partial y, and V is minus partial psi partial x. So based on what we know about U and V, we want to get boundary conditions for psi. So let's see how that works. I'm going to start by looking at the left boundary and the right boundary, so the two vertical boundaries. So in that case, then, the normal velocity will be u. So on those boundaries, the impermeability condition requires that u, the normal velocity, is 0. But u is partial psi partial y, so that's equal to 0. Now if you integrate that along that vertical boundary, so if you integrate with respect to y, it's 0 everywhere. So psi, then, would be a constant. And we can set that constant to be anything we want, so we'll set it to be equal to 0. Now the no slip condition means that the tangential velocity along the surface, which is going to be v, is zero as well. Well v is minus partial psi partial x, so partial psi partial x, well that's equal to zero. So what we end up with is a Dirichlet boundary condition for psi, as well as a Neumann boundary condition for psi. So psi and partial psi partial n, in this case n is x, are both specified. Similarly for the lower boundary, so BC along the bottom of the driven cavity, impermeability requires that the normal velocity, now V, be equal to zero. Well, V is minus partial psi partial x, so partial psi partial x is equal to zero. And so again, psi, the stream function, is equal to zero along that boundary. So along the two vertical boundaries and the bottom boundary, the value of the stream function is zero, Dirichlet. No slip, tangential velocity, U, is now equal to zero. So that requires the partial psi partial y be zero. So again, we have that psi and its normal derivative are both being specified on these fixed boundaries. Now let's look at the top, the upper boundary. The only difference now is it's moving. So impermeability still requires that v be equal to zero. So partial psi partial x is zero. And so the stream function psi is zero. So the value of psi is zero all the way around. Then for no slip, again, the tangential velocity u in this case is now 1 because it's moving, so partial psi partial y is equal to 1. Again, we have psi and its normal derivative being specified on these solid boundaries. So let's look at vorticity and see what ends up happening there. Well, the definition of vorticity is partial v partial x minus partial u partial y. So let's take that lower boundary, a, b, again. Because v is equal to 0, this term, partial v partial x, is 0 and we just have partial u partial y being equal to minus omega. Well, the normal derivative of velocity at a surface, that's related to the wall shear stress at that surface. So in this case, it's the wall shear stress, tau wall, divided by the viscosity, mu. All right, so we have a relationship between vorticity and the shear stress at the wall. We don't know what the shear stress at the wall is any more than we know the vorticity at the wall. So that doesn't help us in terms of getting boundary conditions. That would be the result of the calculation. We do not have an additional boundary condition. All right, so here's the strategy. We have two boundary conditions where we only need one on stream function. 
So I'm going to take one of those. We'll take the Dirichlet boundary condition where psi is a constant on the surface. Then the other boundary condition, the extra Neumann boundary condition, see if we can somehow translate that into a boundary condition on vorticity. So first I'll show you the Thoms method, the simplest approach, and it's actually quite effective. So once again, we'll look at the lower boundary just to illustrate how this works. So this is a horizontal boundary, y is equal to zero. So we had from our vorticity stream function formulation, a Poisson equation for the stream function, where if we know the value of omega from the vorticity transport equation, we can then solve this Poisson equation for the stream function psi. So what we'd like to do is see if we can get a boundary condition on omega at the surface. Well, this, the governing equations that hold in the interior also hold on the boundary. So let's apply this equation on that boundary where psi is equal to zero. So if psi is equal to zero, its first derivative on, along the boundary x is equal to zero, and its second derivative along the boundary x is also equal to zero. So we just have that omega along the wall is equal to minus partial squared psi partial y squared along the wall. So this gives us a relationship between the stream function and the vorticity along that lower wall. Well, we also have that the velocity u is partial psi partial y, and that's equal to zero as well. So we have these two relationships along the wall. Now, just to make things a little more general, let's have that lower wall moving. We can always specify that velocity to be zero to get the case that we are actually looking at here. But let's have it moving such that partial psi partial y at the boundary so that would be equal to u along the boundary. Let's call that g of x. So that's some specified function of x. That's the velocity tangent to that boundary. Let me draw then the boundary. So this is at j is equal to one. So that's this point right here for a given i. So let's just zoom in on that, the grid on that boundary. Then this is j is equal to one. We have a point above j is equal to two, next point above j is equal to three, and then below we have j is equal to zero, so a point outside the domain as we've seen uh, in earlier situations. So let's then take this equation 710, so partial psi partial y is a function, a given function of x, that's the velocity. Let's approximate that using a second order accurate central difference for that first derivative, so it'll be psi i2, which is this value here, minus psi i zero, which is this value here, divided by the distance between them, which is two delta y. So then we have that, that's equal to g, and that's a second order accurate approximation for that first derivative. Well, we want to eliminate psi i zero, the point outside the domain from our equation. So, let, so let's solve for that psi i zero is equal to psi i two, minus two delta y g sub i, and then that's order delta y cubed, because we've multiplied through by the delta y. Now if we take the other equation, omega is minus partial squared psi partial y squared, again use a second order accurate central difference approximation for that second derivative, then omega i one, so that's all the values along the boundary, the lower boundary, is equal to minus, so it'll be psi i two minus two psi i one plus psi i zero divided by delta y squared. That is a second order accurate approximation again. And then we want to eliminate this value, the psi i zero. So we substitute in for psi i zero this expression. Substitute that in, we have omega i one is two over delta y squared times the quantity psi i one minus psi i two plus delta y g sub i. But you'll notice this is only first order accurate in delta y. Now I'll leave it in this general form, but in our case the psi i1, that's the psi on the boundary, so that's equal to zero in the particular situation we're looking at here. But in general you would just want to keep that term. So what this gives us then is a Dirichlet boundary condition for vorticity. If I know psi on the boundary and at the next point in the interior, so here and here, then that gives us an approximation for the value of omega on the boundary, a Dirichlet boundary condition for vorticity. Now the main issue, of course, is that the truncation error is only order delta y in this case. It turns out not to affect the overall truncation error of the method, and that was proven in this paper some years ago. So the accuracy is lower, but it doesn't affect the convergence rate. But it still has an issue with accuracy.
So to fix that, we can introduce Jensen's method. If you go back and look at Thom's method, and if you kind of trace through those delta y's and, and why it ended up being delta y accurate in the end, you'll notice that the problem was we started with only a second order approximation for that, that derivative. If we obtained a third order finite difference approximation, then as I'll show you, we end up with a second order Dirichlet boundary condition in the end. So let's just quickly walk through that. So here we go, we have the minus two psi i zero, minus three psi i one, plus six psi i two, minus psi i three, divided by six delta y, that's equal to g. So that's that partial psi, partial y, is equal to g, but now we're using a third order approximation for that first derivative. Now when we solve for psi i zero, we get this expression here. That's order delta y to the four, because we've multiplied through by delta y. Then when we substitute this for psi i zero in equation 712, we get a slightly more complicated version, but it's still just a Dirichlet boundary condition for omega i one. Once again, psi i one is zero in our particular case, but I'll leave it in for generality. So now we have a second order accurate approximation for the vorticity on the boundary. That's Jensen's method. And we would simply use this in place of this equation at the boundary. So same basic approach, just a little bit more complicated equation. You'll notice it involves the point at the boundary, the first and the second into the domain, whereas for Thom's method, it was just the point at the boundary and the next point in. So as always, higher order approximation, you need to involve more points. Okay, so let me just finish with a few comments. Both of these produce local boundary conditions. We're calculating the values of omega at points along the boundary from values of psi at adjacent points in the interior. So this is a local boundary condition. And the reason why I emphasize that is because some, particularly mathematicians, which I love, they get a little bit uptight. So they don't like these local boundary conditions because it's introducing an error at the boundary. It's still only second order accurate with Jensen's method or first order accurate in Thom's method. So we're introducing an error in the boundary condition. So you could have a situation, for example, where you don't have conservation of mass. There might be some fluid kind of bleeding out of your domain because these boundary conditions aren't 100% correct. They're also kind of moving targets. As the flow develops, as you iterate, as the values of the stream function change, the values, therefore, of vorticity are changing as well. So the boundary conditions are moving targets. They're actually part of the solution. They're obtained from the intermediate solution that you have at any given iteration. So it is a bit unsatisfying mathematically, and there are some potential issues with that. It turns out that it works fine in practice, but there are definitely some issues philosophically with this approach. It is a, a debate that kind of rages within the community. There's a really good paper by Dietmar Remfer in 2003 who kind of summarized these issues and advocates for a global boundary condition. So determining the values of omega from a global perspective, such that you don't have the negative implications of these local boundary conditions. Again, they work fine in practice, but there are definitely some theoretical, mathematical, philosophical issues with this local boundary condition approach. Just want you to be aware of that. And if you're interested, you can look for more information on that.